Let me ask you something. If you are on the receiving end of a surprise birthday party, would you prefer that you knew something about that surprise birthday party, or would you prefer that you knew nothing about that surprise birthday party? I hope for all of you, you would have chosen that you knew nothing about that surprise birthday party. Why? There's nothing more exciting and exhilarating than that feeling of truly being surprised by your loved ones and by your friends. You know, the very word surprise means that you didn't know that it was a shock to you. There is no fun in a surprise party when it isn't a surprise. You know, I've tried on a few occasions to surprise my wife, Cindy, on her birthday, but it usually fails. Once I was asked to delay her as a couple of friends of hers wanted to throw her a surprise dinner. When she showed up at the dinner, she acted surprised, so I was happy that the plan worked. On the car ride back home, I turned to her and asked, Honey, were you really surprised? She said to me, Not really. I got very suspicious. I asked her why. She told me, It's because you're always rushing me, and you always get angry if I'm late. But this time, you didn't rush me at all. In fact, if you remember, I asked you for five more minutes to get ready. And you replied, sure, as long as you need. You never say that. So I knew something was up. But I appreciate the effort you made to surprise me. You know, other than surprise parties, there is enjoyment and freedom in not knowing It's exciting in sports when you don't know the final score of the game you are watching. You like to watch sports live to experience of not knowing the outcome. It is not very fun to watch a game where you know who will win. It's exciting in the revelation of whether your baby will either be a boy or a girl. That's why today people people do gender reveal parties. We're all excited in what we don't know and are excited by the surprise of having that information revealed. There is excitement and anticipation in a television show or movie where you can't wait for it to end to find out who is the culprit or who is the killer or will it end well? Will they catch him or her? Will the good guys win? If you already know what's going to happen, then what is the point of watching. The same goes with books. A book is called a page turner when you can't wait to get to the end to see what will happen to your favorite character, to see how it will all end. If you jump to the very end of the book to find out what's going to happen, what's the point of even reading? The fun is in the journey that it takes for you to get there page after page to get to the conclusion. But why is it when it comes to life that we don't like uncertainties? We want to know everything. We want to know how things are going to happen. We expect, even demand from God to know His will and His plans. And He has to tell us when we ask Him And we get upset at him when he doesn't tell us or he leaves us hanging by not giving us enough information. We have failed to realize that joy comes from uncertainties. There is excitement and freedom in not knowing. But sadly, we don't want to trust him even in things like this. We want to be in control. We want to know everything now. Perhaps you're feeling like this as we go through the uncertainties that surround the coronavirus. When will I get back to school? Will school start on time? Will it start on time next year? Will there be another year or half a year of online education? What about my graduation? How will honors be determined? 
What about my wedding date? Will it be affected? What will be the rules for social distancing and mass gatherings in three months' time? What about my vacation plans? What about my birthday party or an anniversary that is to be celebrated? What about my job? Will I still have one after this lockdown? Will my company survive? How do I pay my creditors? Oh, there are so many stresses and the uncertainty of the situation we're in right now. And so we cry out, Lord, we need to know. Help us by bringing some clarity of what in the world you're doing and why do you allow us to go through what we're going through. Or perhaps we cry out, Lord, when will the vaccine be ready so that we can get back to life as we knew it? I don't like what will be a new normal. When will all of this be over? And when will things get back to normal, the normal that I define as normal? I want to know, Lord, and I want to know now. Now, I want to say that the Bible does not teach that we shouldn't prepare or plan. But there is a balancing attitude that the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that in life there are certain things that we will not know and that we will encounter uncertainties, that God will not reveal all the reasons why He allows certain things to happen in life. And it's okay if that happens. We can enjoy the freedom in not knowing. We don't have to stress out about it. In fact, we can just kick back and relax and stay calm in not knowing. Not because it's some sort of coping method for stress, but because understanding that there is enjoyment in the freedom in not knowing, we get a greater appreciation for who God is, and it will deepen our faith walk. There was a man in the Bible who it took 42 chapters for him to finally understand the realities that allow him to accept the unknown and to accept that he won't know and to find joy and peace in his life as he never finds out. And that person is Job. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Job, chapter 42. We're going to take a look at verses 1 to 7. Job, chapter 42, the very last chapter in the book of Job. Now, to give you a, a brief background on the life of Job, although I encourage you to read this book, perhaps, in the spare time that you have during this quarantine, Job was described as a righteous man who loved God and lived uprightly. And God blessed Job. But in the spiritual realm, in the cosmic realm, Satan comes to God and says that your righteous friend Job would curse you and stop following you if you took away his blessings, if his life wasn't so easy. And so... God allows Satan to take everything away from Job. Job loses his children. He loses his property. He loses his possessions. He loses his livestock. It's all gone. In fact, Job suffers health-wise. But Job doesn't curse God, although he begins to wander. He never loses his faith. But he asks some questions because he did not understand. During this time of grief, three friends of Job come and offer unbiblical advice which further discourages Job. And then after these three friends leave, still another younger friend comes to offer advice on why God is doing this to him. All of them are wrong. They propose that perhaps Job sinned or maybe he did something wrong and now God is punishing him. That got to Job. Job had no idea, but he began to wonder. 
Of course, we as the readers know this isn't the case. When these four friends and his wife finish giving their advice and opinions, now God speaks to Job in chapters 38 to the end of the book. He basically tells Job all of them are wrong. But to our surprise, instead of telling Job the reason he lost everything from family to possessions and why he has health problems, instead, God in chapters 38 to 41 tell about how great he is. Telling Job about the beauty and the intricacy of nature. In these four chapters, he talks about the cosmos, even about the animal world, a world that is ordered and created and crafted by the Almighty God. And the point of all this is that God does not answer Job's questions directly, but God shows His greatness and His sovereignty. In fact, so awesome is God's revelation of who He is that the Bible tells us in Job chapter 40, verse 4, that Job is rendered speechless. He covers his mouth. He doesn't know what to say. And after God finishes revealing the greatness of who He is without telling Job why these things have happened to him, Job comes to three understanding, three realizations of how he can continue living his life without ever knowing the reason. That he can live in peace with the uncertainties that he has in his heart. And as we take a look at verses 1 to 7 of chapter 42, I want to note three realizations that allow Job to enjoy and come to terms with life in the freedom in not knowing. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Job affirms the truth that he has come to acknowledge after the great revelation of who God is that God is supremely sovereign. That instead of God answering his questions of why things are happening in his life, it's okay because Job realizes that God is supremely sovereign. He can do everything and anything and no one can stop him because he controls everything which means no one controls him and the simplicity of job's admission in verse 2 tell us that you can do everything and no one can stop you that's the very definition of sovereignty total control god is sovereign he is in total control that is the first realization number one God is sovereign and in control. God is sovereign and in control. Just because you don't have your questions answered does not mean you cannot come to the realization that God is sovereign and in control. This is the realization that Job comes to. And because God is his heavenly father and is one that he can trust he comes to the understanding that he doesn't need to know everything because God is sovereign. Let me ask you something. When you are going to select someone to do a task, when you are going to put someone in charge to accomplish something, what type of person do you select? You select the one who is the most capable, someone who will get things done, Someone who is confident and has things figured out. Someone who is able to solve a problem if it comes up. Someone who can deal with any hurdles or any opposition. Someone you do not have to constantly remind. Someone you don't have to follow up with every moment. The most ideal person 
to whom you can delegate a great important responsibility is someone you can tell the instruction to at the very beginning and you don't have to mind them and they just simply come to you at the end and they tell you it's done. You don't have to ask them how they did it. You don't need to know the details. And that's, in fact, the very reason you delegate an important task to a person like that because they are trustworthy. Now, if you're going to micromanage that person and ask all the details and ask for an update every five minutes, you might as well do it yourself. Or he or she may say, why don't you do it? I hope you see my point. In the same way, God tells Job and he tells us, if you're going to put me in charge of your life, if I'm really sovereign and in control, then I don't need to explain and report to you what I am doing. You have to trust that I have everything under control. And isn't that at the end of the day what we want to hear? We don't need to know all the details so that we can enjoy, we can relax. We just need to know that the person that's taking care of us has everything under control. Life is uncertain You and I do not know or have all the details of the life that we live. But rest well and be encouraged. The one who is in charge of our lives is in total control. I'm wondering when you fly in an airplane, do you have to ask the pilot that is flying the plane what flight school he went to? Do you have to research if he tells you that flight school, if it's a top 10 flight school, do you ask him how many hours of flying time do you and the co-pilot have? Do you ask to see the maintenance record of the plane to make sure that the engineers have properly checked every nut and bolt so that this plane is safe to fly? Of course not. Most of us just get into the plane and sit down and we listen to our music or watch the in-flight entertainment, and we simply relax. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to understand everything to accept that the airline you've chosen, the company you've chosen to take you from one point to another is professional and has done all those things under their control so that you can relax. So it is with God. You don't have to understand or know everything You just have to accept that he is in total control and there is no one higher than him. And that's what God is showing Job. And that is the realization and the conclusion Job comes to. And it settles his heart. He accepts that he doesn't know, but it's okay because God is sovereign and he is in control. Now, let's take a look at verse 3 to see what else Job realizes. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Job in verse 3 now repeats the question God had asked earlier in chapter 38 verse 2 when he first speaks to Job. Who are the people who question my wisdom with things they do not understand? Who are these people who is offering unsolicited advice about how I do things when they do not understand? And by doing so, they they share ignorant words. God is rebuking Job's friends who are only guessing at why God is doing certain things. And saying stupid things to Job when it is not based on God in his word. Job now also sees that he is wrong because he did not really understand. Job is admitting in verse 3 that I spoke too soon. I said stuff without fully knowing and fully understanding because these things are beyond my comprehension Job doesn't know. 
Job still doesn't know, but he realizes in verse 3 that the ways and plans of God, which he doesn't understand, note this, are too wonderful for me to comprehend. Imagine, Job has lost family, lost money, lost possessions, his health has problems, and he's able to say that this is part of God's wonderful plan for his life. This is a very tough realization to come to, both for Job and for us. How can these seemingly difficult and troubled things that have happened to Job be a part of God's wonderful plan? Well, 1 Peter and other biblical passages remind us that the trials we go through have a positive effect on us, the building up of our spiritual maturity, the deepening of our faith walk, and other things. There are benefits to the trials we go through. But the great realization that is in view here is that when God has revealed Himself so great and wonderful to Job, that Job comes to the realization that he cannot fully comprehend the ways of God. And that's number two, the second realization that calms the heart of Job, to be able to accept not knowing and be settled in heart. And number two, it's the fact that our limited human minds cannot fully comprehend everything. Our limited human mind cannot fully comprehend everything. We do not know the mind of God. Even the prophet Isaiah writes in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We do not know the mind of God. We cannot ever comprehend fully what He is doing. Job doesn't know why these things have happened to him. But without knowing, without fully comprehending, he's able to come to a place of settlement in his heart that I may never know. And that's okay because these things are too wonderful for me to know. Can you say that during this coronavirus experience? That everything you've gone through, even though there is pain involved, is too wonderful for me to understand what God is doing. But I trust Him. In fact, this is what Paul also echoes when he writes to the Romans in his epistle, the church in Rome. Romans chapter 8, verses 27 to 28. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. God's ways and God's purpose are always according to His perfect will, which we may or may not fully comprehend or know. In fact, that should be a caution to us that we should be very careful whenever we say that something is God's will, whether it's happening in our life or we say that to someone as someone goes through something, well, that's God's will. We better be very careful because we may not have all the facts surrounding why God allows something to happen. God's will is revealed in the Scriptures through the obedience of His biblical principles. It is never God's will when you do not obey biblical principles. If it doesn't follow biblical principles, it's not God's will. God does not contradict Himself. But if you are following and living in biblical principles if you're following in the ways of the Lord, then you can be assured that you are in the center of God's will. Why does recognizing that our 
human minds are limited and do not fully comprehend everything, help us enjoy life. Isn't that restrictive? Doesn't that dumb down our view of ourselves? Well, this realization is going to be a lot harder on our generation because of social media. Social media has made everyone an, an expert on everything. Everyone is now an expert on the coronavirus. Everyone is an expert on infectious disease and its transmissions. Just like social media has made us experts in politics, foreign policy, economics, statistical analysis, philosophy, religion, and every other subject we want to comment on. We become instant experts, even to the extent of God's will and why He's doing certain things. We must take care to acknowledge that truth does matter. And the truth of the matter is that we are limited in our understanding. It doesn't matter how smart you are. You and I do not know everything. There is a reason why God often doesn't tell us everything. Because He knows that our minds can't fully embrace it, accept it, or comprehend it. And He loves us enough not to worry us with things we cannot comprehend or things we cannot understand. If God reveals everything to us, it will only cause us sleepless nights and, and worry. So God says, let me take care of it. You go relax and, and, and leave the running of the universe to me. Don't you worry about the fruits and the flowers and when they will blossom at each season. Do not worry how the animals and the birds will be fed. Let me take care of those things. You just leave those things for me to run and you enjoy your life without worrying about those things. You know, there's a reason why you as parents don't tell your little children all of the things that are happening in your life, the problems at work or perhaps your own financial situation. Because you don't want your child to be troubled or worried. You want them to enjoy their childhood. You want them to play without worry. I remember a few years ago when my children were much smaller, Cindy and I were talking about a family in church that was going through a financial difficult time. And uh, we didn't realize that one of my children was listening in and had caught our conversation. They didn't catch the first part of the conversation, but they only caught the tail end where I said something to the effect of not having enough money. And we didn't know that he had heard. To our surprise, the next few days, we sensed a very troubled child. He wasn't as joyful and as cheerful as he usually was. He didn't seem to have the appetite that he did. And so we called him and we said, son, what's wrong? Why aren't you happy as you always are? And my child said, because daddy, I'm sad. I'm sad because we don't have enough money and I'm worried. I said, who told you? We're fine. God has provided he said, oh, I heard you and mom talking. He said, we don't have enough money. I said, son, we were talking about someone else. Don't you worry. God has taken care of us. He will take care of us in the future. We're just fine. And his attitude completely changed. He was the happy child that he'd always been. Sometimes God doesn't let us know so that he won't trouble us with things that He is still working on. He doesn't trouble us with things that are His problems to deal with. He doesn't tell us because it's other people's issue, not ours, but we like to insert ourselves because perhaps we may know them. Not knowing is a very good thing. I don't know if you remember a story in the New York Times uh, last month of a group uh, that went on a 25-day rafting trip 
through the Grand Canyon in the U.S. They had no devices, no access to news. And after 25 days of joyfully rafting down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon, enjoying stories by campfire and fellowship with one another, they came back to the realities of a now coronavirus-filled world. Now let me ask you a question. If you're one of those rafters on that trip, would you rather know about COVID-19 before you went on this trip or during this trip or after your trip? I think most all of us would say, tell us after our trip is done so that we would enjoy. We would rather not know. I hope you see my point. There is a joy in not knowing. And plus, our human knowledge is limited. And so, even if God tells us everything when we demand Him to do so, we wouldn't even comprehend. Our heads couldn't take it. We would only be discouraged. Let me give you another example. When my kids were young and they asked me, Dad, What did you study in college? I I told them I studied math and I was an engineer. Now, they were young enough that they just learned how to add. It would be foolish for me, as they asked about what an engineer and a mathematician does, for me to explain, well, children, we study differential equation and Laplace transforms and electromagnetics and microbolometers and the etching of solid-state devices, they would have no comprehension when they have just barely figured out that 1 plus 1 equals 2 and that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and they still got some of that wrong. If I told them all of that, they would have been discouraged. Perhaps they would think to themselves, I will never become a mathematician. I don't want to be an engineer. But by withholding that information until they have matured or they know more, then they are able to more fully comprehend the beauty of knowledge. But because our knowledge is limited, because our minds are limited, then God is the one who wisely tells us what we need to know and wisely holds back what we don't need to know. Do we trust God enough? This is what Job comes to realize. It's too wonderful for me to comprehend. So thank you, God, for not telling me. That's how I see God's love as demonstrated when He doesn't tell us everything. He doesn't tell us everything so that we can enjoy life, so that we can relax, so that we will not be confused, we will not be troubled of heart, We will not worry. He says to us, I love you. Enjoy life. I've got things under control. Look with me at verses 4 to 6. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job now repeats another question that God asks him in chapter 38, verse 3, and chapter 40, verse 7. I will ask you some questions, Job, God says, and you have to answer me. And in the context of these questions, God was going to test Job to explain to him the ways of the world. How does nature work? How have I created the animals in such a manner that they do what they do. And so that's what God does in chapters 38 to 41 to describe a lot of things in nature and how it all works. And of course, Job is speechless. He cannot answer God's questions because he doesn't know. He doesn't know. So Job comes to this realization in in verse 5. I've only heard how you act, God, from my friends, and they were all wrong. 
And they told some things to me that warped my mind, that caused me to derive some false conclusions about what you were doing. But now after the revelation of you and how you created nature, and you asked me to answer, now, Lord, you have shown me firsthand with my own eyes as I look around nature that I can't understand everything. I don't know everything. And so Job, in verse 6, repents. I abhor myself and I repent in dust and ashes. You see, in the intricacies of his handiworks in creation, God shows in all of his power and majesty that there are things that we simply can enjoy but not understand. I encourage you to read chapters 38 to 41 and see if you can explain If God were to ask you these similar questions, how you can explain how everything works. As someone wrote, God gave Job an oral science examination covering aspects of cosmology, oceanography, meteorology, astronomy, and zoology. And if you can't answer all of these questions, what right do you and I have to tell God, answer me? What's the point of all this? Number three, that we can enjoy the freedom in not knowing. We can enjoy with the freedom that not knowing brings us because everything around us declares we do not fully understand. So why do we insist on fully knowing when we don't even know what we can see? Did you hear that? Did you get that? We can't and do not fully know how nature works, but we can certainly enjoy it. All you have to do is just look around, open your eyes at the universe around you, the beautiful animals that God has created, the intricacies in how they interact with each other, the plants, and even this virus that scientists say we don't fully understand now. And we look up at the heavens. Psalm chapter 19 verse 1 tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God, but it also declares to us that we can enjoy many things we do not understand. For example, if you were to get into your cars today, you simply put the keys into the ignition, you turn it, and it works, it moves. We don't need to know how a drivetrain works or how an internal combustion engine works. We just put in the keys, we turn it, and and it moves. Now, that doesn't remind us that we can enjoy something that we don't fully understand. Just look at nature. Tomorrow, the sun will rise and it will set. You and I can enjoy the beautiful sunrise and the beautiful sunset. And we don't have to worry whether it will rise at what time or whether it will set or how it all works with the spinning of planetary systems around each other and and the reflection of of, of lights and, and whatever else in the atmosphere. God knows all that. He's worked it out. We just sit back and we enjoy. You and I don't have to worry because there is a God who is infinitely wise and He has made everything work perfectly in His plans. You and I know that knowledge is wonderful, but the Bible also reminds us that knowledge puffs up. It often creates pride. And that's why God withholds certain things from us knowing so that we won't get so prideful that we can just simply enjoy in humility the things that God is doing and God is showing us. There's only one with all knowledge, and that is God. And if we were to worry about not knowing that, that's on us, poor us but to be able to enjoy the freedom that comes from not knowing, that's when there's a breakthrough in our spiritual life because it ascribes more praise and glory to God. Our view of God is changed to hold Him on a higher standard as He so deserves. 
that the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God knows everything and we don't, but that's okay. We're going to enjoy life. Look with me at verse 7. And so it was, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. I want you to notice what God says at the end of verse 7 about Job's epiphany, his realization, his understanding. My servant Job, he got it right. He finally gets it. He finally realizes that God is sovereign and in control. He realizes that the human mind is limited and cannot fully comprehend everything. He finally realizes that he can enjoy the freedom of not knowing. He, his heart can be settled in spite of what he's gone through that he may never know the reason, but it's okay. He can enjoy life. These are tough realizations, but these are the realizations that God wants us to understand. The same realization that Job got. You see, my friends, you know this. The most memorable and fun trips are those when something unexpected happens. You remember those trips. The greatest adventures are the ones that things don't go as planned. The best parties are the ones where there is a surprise. So enjoy not knowing. Enjoy the freedom and the settling of heart that comes when we acknowledge that we may not know, but God is in control. That we may not know, but we know the one who is in control. You see, it's okay not to know as long as you know the one who is in control. People are nervous and scared of the unknown. And their minds usually often go to the worst case scenarios and negative thoughts fill their mind because they simply not only not know, they don't know the God who's in control. But we who are followers of Jesus Christ, when we are uncertain and when we are worried that we don't know what's going to happen next, then that should drive us to know more the God who is in control to know the heart of God. And when we know God, we know that the heart of God is love. People are worried when they are unsure of who God is, when they are unsure of the motives of why He does what He does and why He allows what He allows. But my friends, here's a great opportunity to read the Scriptures and know God more. And when you know God more in times like this, you will be able to relax. If you ask me who I want to plan a surprise party for me, and my options were my wife or my childhood friends, I would pick my wife, hands down. Why? Because I trust her. She won't tie me up or leave me in an abandoned warehouse, as perhaps my childhood friends may plan. She won't throw me into a swimming pool. I know my wife wouldn't do that. So I'm okay with her planning the surprise because I know I won't be hurt in the process and because I know her well. I know the one who is planning it. So I'm okay with God planning the uncertainties because it's Him that's in charge and He doesn't have to tell me the details. I'll sit back and enjoy the surprises that come along, but because I know Him, I know the surprises He has in store for me. So Lord, plan those surprises in my life. You don't have to tell me everything or anything. Whatever they may be, whether they be good or in my definition, bad, 
whether they be successes or trials. And if I don't understand, I will learn to enjoy the freedom of not knowing. May that be your acknowledgement and your acceptance and your expression of faith. Lord, plan the surprises in my life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words. Thank you for the revelation of who you are and what you are doing. Help us to understand that not all of our questions may be answered. And sometimes it brings us pain because we wonder what you are doing in this world. But help us to focus on you and your heart, which is love. And we are your children and we call upon you as our Abba Father. And so in that intimacy of relationship, we know that you only have the best in store for us. Help us, Lord, to realize your sovereignty and the fact that you are in control. Help us to accept that our limited human minds cannot fully comprehend everything. Help us to enjoy the freedom in not knowing Father, during this time, may our faith walk be deepened. May we know you more. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.